Whether you're looking for a Chevy car, truck, or SUV, go see my friends at Apple Chevy in Tinley Park. With over 500 new and used vehicles in stock, they have what you're looking for. And at the lowest price possible, go to AppleChevy.com. Starship Rocon Show with Anna DeVlantis, off for another day of broadcast insolence. Anna, off today. Mr. Richard Roper is in the studio. Lucky he, me. As he is almost every day. So regardless yeah. of, I don't even know why I need to mention that, you just hear that voice and that's him. It's like one of those relief pitchers that gets 90 appearances now, right? <laughs> Nobody goes the full game. That's <laughs> fine. I'm glad to be here. You're Happy the closer. Here. I think All that's right. where we're call you forever. All <laughs> right. You know who else is in the studio with us? This is rock and roll royalty in the studio with us. I pray that you are not offended by the term rock and roll royalty. Uh, I'm not offended by the term royalty. <laughs> Good. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, and the, uh, Todd Rundgren is a, one of those names that has, I think you, you have been the symbol of quality in music for greater than 40 years. It says here 50 years. Do, do you mind if I say 50 years? You can say 50 years. I was 71 in two months, and I started playing music when I was professionally when I was 18. So, wow. First record probably when I was 19 or 20. So, yeah. And in it's Philadelphia. Really, yeah. Growing up in Philly. Yeah. It's Correct. really hard to pin you down to a certain genre of in modern music because you seem to have been involved in so many different projects you you know your sound uh from the early 1970s was you know very much in that you know you were in the sound of the era then but you've moved eras and you've moved different styles all the way through and you've produced music mm-hmm. in all different styles all the way through is this uh, and and to me the when you meet musicians who've done that it's really about the love of of the technique of it right is that what got you well it isn't it isn't simply the technique i just music if you're if you're naturally into music if you're born to music it's just a constantly fascinating subject you know and there's a very small palette you know uh western whole tone scale you know has like 12 notes in it and only maybe five of them fit into an average melody so you know you eventually you wind up stealing from somebody it's an interesting way you put things together that yeah. results in new music just figuring out new ways to plug things into each other so that process can yield almost infinite results and um I've been fascinated by that aspect of it. And you started almost uh, by default, uh, Todd, as a producer, because when you were just starting off, you were recording albums and the engineer would leave and you'd kind of tinker around sometimes and say, like, well, maybe we could do something different with the with the board and kind of learn by touch. Yeah, I got I had the opportunity when we did our early the first two NAS records to actually be a little bit more hands on involved. And that ultimately led to me. um getting a job with the uh, Albert Grossman organization as an engineer and producer uh, right after I left the NAS. The NAS only lasted like 18 months before we exploded. Hmm. And uh, hey, when you exploded, you don't mean like the good exploded. You mean you exploded, exploded. Yeah, yeah it was no, over. It, it imploded, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I, after a couple of weeks on the street, I wound up getting a job doing engineering and production for artists like the band and Jesse Winchester and Janis Joplin and <laughs> Paul Butterfield Band and and all of these acts that I had grown up listening to wound up being a smart aleck young kid behind the board. <laughs> And uh, got successful at that before I ever did a solo record. So I started out more or less. uh, I started out in a band. Then I decided I didn't want to be in a band. I wanted to be a record producer. And then after doing a couple of records, I said, you know, I want to do a vanity project. Uh, You know, I just want to do a record for fun. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to quit production. And I don't want to start another band. And I don't want to go through all of that. Did you want a tour? What did you think about that? I, you know, traveling was fine. I was traveling as a producer. You know, I go to Nashville, London, all these, Mm -hmm. LA, all these other places, but it was the politics of being in a band that I was too young to, uh, 
uh, to understand, you know, dealing with other people in a way that um, is diplomatic and that sort of thing. So that was kind of kind of why has there ever been diplomacy yeah. in rock and roll? <laughs> kind of why I like being producer because you you know wind up ordering people around half the time, but um, you have the ultimate say so. And kind of like all directing all a film instead of even just having the lead in the film. Like yeah, that. a producer is more like a film director uh, as opposed to a film producer who essentially comes up with the money right. for it. But then, uh, what, then when you produced under your own name, when you did your own stuff, I mean, it became huge hits, right? Some of it did, but uh, people don't remember how eclectic those records were, how there were songs that sounded like they could be on the radio, radio and songs that definitely sounded like they would never be on the radio. Right. <laughs> and most of my records had some mix of that, and it was my third record, Something Anything, that seemed to have the most number, because it was a double album, I guess, but it had the most number number of of so-called hits there were like three or four hits off of it and so that was what simultaneously broke me as an artist but also locked me into a certain space in the minds of some people and so the record after that my fourth record a wizard a true star had nothing like that on it <laughs> well some of your songs too i mean even some of your hit singles todd and people might know like for example you wrote love is the answer which became a huge mega hit Most of your song is like, you know, can we still be friends or it wouldn't have made any difference. These are very sophisticated for pop songs. They remind me of, you know, the, the more sophisticated Beach Boys uh, era, you know, Pet Sounds type of thing. Well, they were a big influence. The Beach Boys were an influence. The Beatles were an influence. But there were influences that in terms of songwriting um, were actually a little bit more um deeply felt for me because of that whole band thing you know like the beatles the beach boys those are those are bands and so they write for the number of people that they have in the band sure. you know yeah. and uh i was into things like burt Bacharach, mm. um and that's where that sort of more i guess sophisticated pop thing comes from can, I, you might, can we still be friends can you throw that up here for a second because i there's something about this song specifically mm. that always got me mm -hmm. because you do something you 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 use a technique in it um that i think it, when you watch movies like the like the uh the queen movie that just came out right mm -hmm. bohemian rhapsody there's it's it's so formulaic in terms of the way they make a movie where it's a guy sitting in a you know it's the artist sitting in front of the producers or the, or the you know the record label executives and they're fighting with them this will never get on the radio this will never get on the radio and i always thought to myself i don't i think you know i'm sure for younger bands and smaller mm -hmm. bands that's true but i mean once a, a band became an arena band I don't think those conversations ever happened, right? <laughs> well, usually, the, you know, the artist winds up, it, once you get a million seller, you've got something of the upper hand at that mm -hmm. point, you know, because you have um, paid off all the money that you owed to the record label. <laughs> right. You know, that they advanced We're breaking you. even. We're platinum. Yeah, we're, <laughs> you know, you know, now we or have the not. power, yeah. Yeah. But you know, that's, you know, that was a feat that not a lot of, not a lot of bands could do. You know? Be Things just can't go on like before, but can we still be friends? Certainly hear the Burt Bacharach moment there, you know? Yeah, there's a lot of weird suspensions in it. There, are, You know, most people write songs that are straight block chords, you know, A, B, um verse chorus that kind of thing you know and all major chords sometimes a seventh or something like that mm -hmm. but when you start throwing all in all of these weird suspended notes it sounds more um orchestrally influenced i guess mm -hmm. you know rather than just a lot of it comes from writing on a piano as opposed to a guitar because the guitar only has six strings and some kind of chord formations and and bass notes are hard to play you know mm -hmm. your fingers aren't long enough um but a piano you got every note you could possibly play just laying out there in front of you equally accessible and sometimes when you're writing a song that's all you do is you just put your hands down you know right and start moving them around and yeah. you could see that in the 1970s a lot of the great acts 
were it, they they were composed on pianos because mm-hmm. you and they would have these very lush orchestration and there was a big production moment then too right mm-hmm. it was sort of a, a follow on from the from the almost the big band era where they would have whether you were down at RCA in Nashville or you were out in LA they'd have these gigantic orchestral rooms mm-hmm. that you could work in right and with lush strings and things like that and what I always found with you is that you were right in that moment of <laughs> to Keith Moon, please be quiet. It's a, it's an effing opera. You're having like an operatic <laughs> moment, you know. That because to me, when you get guys who are like crazy ass rock bands like the Who mm-hmm. or the Stones, and then they then when they go into the studio, they're building these beautiful lush things, mm-hmm. right? And that was that was your era. Uh, that was uh, that was the power ballad. You know, it was no matter even if you were like a hard rock band or something like that, known for the hard rock. By the time you had like your third or fourth single, you had to have the power ballad, you know, which is the big, lush, lots of background vocals, you know, more orchestration than the band normally has and that sort of thing. Something That's important a, to be said. Yeah, something like that. You Major know, themes. sometimes it's sometimes they don't even let the band play. They just have the lead singer <laughs> replace yeah. the band with an orchestra or something like that. That eventually led to like White Snake even doing power ballad no matter who you were you had to do one yeah everybody had to have the power ballad or else you were um you weren't taking full advantage of that market because the truth about metal bands is their audiences are principally boys and and, you needed, the girls needed to go for a reason and yeah you needed to give the girls a reason to go <laughs> like yeah. or the give the boys uh-huh. a way to get the girls to go to the show I they, totally they're gonna understand. they're gonna play that power ballad <laughs> <laughs> from homecoming right. yeah. so todd rungren tell us about this tour you're you're here for two nights at athenaeum mm-hmm. theater which and and people when i say that they get a little confused <laughs> uh it is at the 2936 north southport it's uh, next to this gigantic big beautiful church right there and it's yeah. actually the it's, it's attached to it it's a theater Theater, it's a great venue. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful, except for the green room and the downstairs. Yeah. Uh, you, oh, it's you, not the way. Yeah, right? it always is. It reminds you of the old that? days. That's all right. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it will remind you of the old days down there. Uh, but the theater, for, for the paying public, they're going to love this place. Uh, and it's tomorrow night and the following night. You can go to Todd's website, Todd-Rungren.com, uh, to look, or just uh, Google him for Chicago, mm-hmm. Todd yep. Rungren in Chicago, or, plus the book. Or Google Athenaeum. Now, don't do that, because no one knows how to... That might send you down a vortex you'll never come back from. (laughs) Rattleback Records on Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Todd is going to be signing his new book as well, The Individualist, Digressions, Dreams, and Dissertations. And this is all small format chapters, right? Isn't that the idea? Uh, uh, Each chapter is one page, and each page is three paragraphs. So it's a very simple format. Uh... I did it that way for a couple of reasons, um, principally probably because I'm not a great reader, and one of the things that puts me off about reading a book is I realize I can't just open it anywhere. Mm-hmm. I've got to start at the very beginning and plot all the way through it to understand what would ha- have happened. You've made a great bathroom book, and people still took their books in the <laughs> exactly. bathroom. Exactly. It's to yeah. keep one in the toilet, yeah. you know, for your guests, because, you know... It, <laughs> There's a blurb. It, and, and put a one-chapter limit on them, you know, so that they <laughs> don't... True. Right. You, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> move. Keep moving. Light a candle in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, well, this is you know it is such an honor to meet you because you you have been I, I said this uh, when we were getting ready to bring you on that you've influenced generations of music and there's a sound that and I think you know can we still be friends is one of those those song those songs that that indicates when you hear you hear haunting versions of that mm-hmm. throughout music over the over the ensuing 40 years well that was one of my most covered songs as a matter of fact it was covered by rod stewart covered it mm. colin blundstone covered it robert palmer covered yeah. it there are probably some other cover versions that i haven't heard so i that whatever it is that you're talking yeah. about obviously it's something that appeals to singers you and know, it was they, used they to want amaz- to sing that whatever yeah. it is and it was used to amazing emotional effect in uh, vanilla sky in cameron crowe's film and uh, a very key moment uh, cameron's a good you know a great great guy and a great fan and i'm a cameron fan and i met cameron when he was like 17 years old writing for rolling stone was, yeah he was writing it might have been cream or rolling stone or one of those magazines and it was like maybe his second writing assignment he ever had and he followed utopia out to um santa fe new mexico we had a gig 
that oh. got canceled, and so we were just goofing off in Santa Fe. So you're the almost famous band? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> the yeah, still sorry. water. <laughs> well, he didn't. De- he didn't depict what happened with us. Some, somehow we uh, got a big bunch of mushrooms, and the entire band and crew took a bunch of mushrooms and went out to an Indian pueblo reservation, mm-hmm. you know, to watch the sunset, wow. stuff like that. Like and poor Cameron animal. had to follow us and watch us the whole <laughs> time, you know. Oh, a little notebook, yeah. Yeah. But, he, kid. <laughs> but he never wrote about it. I guess he thought it was too private or something, you know. <laughs> But he never wrote about that. <laughs> How what amazing! It, I, what he has done to um, keep that sound and that is such an important era and keep that alive in so many ways through his work is, uh, you know, you just it, every time a, a Cameron Crowe movies and some you know some are better than others. I loved Aloha. You did not love Aloha, but I loved Aloha. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Cameron well, didn't love Aloha at this point. But that's I still he, I love most of his films. That's for sure. That's uh, that's probably true. But there are so many. But but his use of music, there's just nothing. You know, the Scorsese best. and he yeah. are the two greatest in terms of that. Yeah. So. Well, he's you know just been uh, obviously you know a huge music fan. It's kind of surprising that he never got into music himself i mean his wife was in a band you right. know, he would write about bands like say he applies it you know creatively in all of his projects i'm kind of surprised that you know even michael mann thinks he's a musician you know? <laughs> Yeah, there's a, so he gets out of, gets yeah. out a synthesizer yeah. and just holds one key down. You know? yeah. But it's his finger. You know? There are a lot of people who think they're musicians. I yeah. think that's one of the problems. All right, but you are truly one, and you are a legend, my friend. Thank you so much, Todd Rungren. Thank you. Go see him tomorrow night and Wednesday night at Athenaeum, 2936 North Southport. Just uh, just look up Todd Rungren in Chicago there on the go. Google, and you'll yeah. find him. And, and the book signing, if you want to go meet him, Rattleback Records, that is at uh, 5405 North Clark, Clark and Foster in Chicago and Andersonville start Wednesday at 2 o'clock.